We may live over 5,000 miles from Lincoln Financial Field, but what we lack in proximity, we make up for in the film study and each and every week in the off season, we'll be bringing you breakdowns that are loosely related to film study from across the pond in the Sooner State. Welcome to On the Shane Page. I am your host, Shane Half. You can follow me on Twitter at Shane Half NFL. And I'm joined by BGN's own film guru, Johnny Page. Give him a follow on Twitter at Johnny Page 9. Johnny, how are you doing this evening? Yeah, I'm good. I wondered if you were going to edit the intro. In our defense, there is very little film going on now. We've uh, we've dragged out some film. We've done the Kellen Moore breakdown last week. We've done some Jalen Hurts breakdown. Um, we're very much, we're, I guess, a very different style of episode. Um, before you introduce Les, I was looking through my Twitter earlier on, and I realized I joined in 2014. Um, and I've probably spoke to Les like on and off, like you do with everyone on Twitter. But I'm pretty sure if you were to ask me like Eagles journalists that, I've basically always, always read. It would be Les, it'll be Kemsky and BLG. And I've had Kemsky on the podcast once. We had BLG recently. So it's good to go for the free P. Um, this is probably the third one of someone that, I mean, I joined Twitter in 2014. I've been following the birds since 2010. And I think they're sort of like the free and probably Tommy uh, Lawler as well. Those three or mm-hmm. four have basically been sort of like consistently there throughout my entire Eagles fandom. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool Les, to have you on the pod. But Shane, I'll... Great to be here. Under too much. Yeah, yeah. We are joined today by a very special guest. We teased this out last week, but Les Bowen is going to be joining us today. Uh, Les, for those of you that don't maybe follow the Eagles as much online, maybe you just watch the games. Les has been around the team for a long time. He started covering the Eagles back in 2002 for the Daily News, later for the Inquirer. Uh, now he writes here and there for phly.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Les Bowen. Uh, Les, how are you doing? It's morning for you and me. It's afternoon or yes. evening for Johnny, but how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, great to be with both of you. I uh, last Mid last season, I personally sort of felt like I finally made it when I wrote up a post on Twitter about how to fix the Eagles offense. And I came back to Twitter later and it had just blown up. And then I realized that Les had retweeted it and I had all these views that I wasn't used to. So it broke my Twitter for a day or two. But then I was like, you know, I've made it. Les read something of mine and he retweeted it. So it's awesome to speak with you today. I'm glad you're here with us. Well, I I have to apologize for infecting you with uh, my followers. Uh, Some of them are are crazy, but, uh, you know, (laughs) but uh, yeah, it's a it's it's quite an instrument, Twitter. Uh, I, I spend too much time on it, but I'm I'm really glad. I was glad to see what you're doing, and I thought it was uh, really interesting. All right. Well, we do have some questions for Les today. If you guys are watching live here on YouTube or Twitter, you can drop some com or some comments or questions, and we can try to work those in as well. But Les, we'll start off with this one. You've been around the Eagles organization for a long time. How did you get into covering the Eagles? Well. Uh, I covered the Flyers for the Daily News from 1989 to 2002. And by 2002, I was in my mid-40s, and our two boys were growing up, and they had games and concerts and plays and things like that. And hockey is uh, 82 games a year plus the playoffs, and you travel constantly. I remember distinctly there was a – That last year, there was a sequence of five games in eight nights across the continent from Calgary to California to Dallas. And, you know, you're not flying on charters with the team here. You're figuring out a way to get from Calgary to San Jose by the next night and rent a car and get, you know. And I remember thinking, you know, if I'm doing this in 10 years, I'm going to be dead. (laughs) Um, So, uh, something happened at the Daily News. Uh, some beats were being shuffled around. Marcus Hayes was covering the Eagles. He was going to take over the Phillies beat, and they needed an Eagles writer. And the Eagles are, of course, the biggest beat in sports in Philly. And although I loved covering the Flyers, the Flyers, Philly's a good hockey town as American hockey towns go. It's very passionate. Certainly was in those days. The team's been down lately, but it was a Flyers was a good beat, but 
I, I was tired of the travel. I, I liked the bigger stage of the Eagles and eight road games a year, three of which you drive to. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was that was very uh, that was very appealing to me. So uh, I, I, you know, put my hat in the ring, as they used to say, and uh, got the uh, got the job. And uh, it was a time of uh, considerable turmoil. The first uh, story I covered was uh, the Eagles had franchise tagged Jeremiah Trotter, and he was very upset about this. And there was a lot of back and forth, and they ended up releasing him, even though he was still a very viable uh, player in the middle of his career, just because it had blown up into such a huge mess. Uh, and he signed with Washington. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that was a good way to get my feet wet. You know, it was uh, quite a big deal uh, in Philly. Of course, he came back eventually, came back twice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was, I remember being surprised by the fact that everything on the Eagles beat was such a huge deal. You know, I've written about how when the, when the schedule came out, the first year I was covering the Eagles, like the editor called me and said, Hey, the schedules, you know, the schedule's coming out. I said, okay. And I was used to the flyer schedule coming out. And I'd write like four or five paragraphs about that, you know? And uh, no, 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 we, we need like a back page story, like a big, you know, huge story on the schedule coming out. And I was like, <laughs> I had no idea how to do that, but I figured it out. <laughs> But it is a big deal because when you only have 16 or at that time, 16 games, now it's 17, people travel to the games and they want to know, you know, when are we in Arizona? What's, you know, and uh, that was all new to me back then. A lot of things were new to me, uh, That's, uh, but I enjoyed it quite a bit and it was a good move for me. That's a little, little different as Garrett points out on Twitter. It's a little different in an era without the internet too, because people couldn't just go look it up online and see, right. see when the schedule was. So um, yeah, that's interesting. It's also interesting that even back then the Eagles had issues with linebackers who, who yeah, would have oh ever God, known. Yeah. 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 That Jerry they Robinson, you know, I did that story a couple times. Uh, you can call up Jerry Robinson every year before the draft and say, Hey, you're the last uh, linebacker the Eagles took in the first round in uh, what was it? 1979. I'd have to look it up, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's been a perennial uh, concern, I think among fans. It's um, it's weird. Cause I, I always like talking to journalists, like in a, in a, in a second world, I'd love to have been a journalist. Like I started writing it sort of in here when I was like 16 to 18. And part of the reason why I'm so thankful for, to BLG is I sort of see myself as like a part-time journalist in some ways, despite it not being my full-time job. Um, but it's just so weird how things have changed, isn't it? Like the way print media was, like I'm still old school, I still read newspapers. Um, I always like talking to journalists. I think they're, I don't want to say they're a dying breed. That seems unfair. Oh, no, they are. Yeah. But <laughs> it feels like it's very much about like reporters and who you know now. And it's not really about sticking around a certain team. Like you get more knowledge from the big guys. Um, it must have been quite cool. Uh, I wish I'd sort of followed the team in some ways like 20 years ago when it was you sort of had to read from certain people who you know you could trust. Um, whereas now, I guess it's so different, just the way we always sort of fans consume media. Um, it is a shame well, yeah, the way it, it's going it in many ways. Be, you know, I got into this because I wanted to make a living writing. Yeah. And sports was a good vehicle for that. I wasn't really I was a terrible athlete as a kid. <laughs> Uh, I didn't play on a school team for anything because I wasn't good enough, you know. Um, but I like to write and I followed sports. And, you know, that was it, it, at the time I came up, that was kind of the the mold. Now it's more about, um, well, things like this. You know, I, people don't like to read as much. Um It's much more visual. It's much more like what you guys do with film. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's certainly not what I, you know, if I were growing up today, I don't know that I would be attracted to this field because it's not, I wanted to write, you know, that was my, that was my, my goal. And writing is kind of really, yeah, writing evocatively about things and, and explaining things and, you know, going to somebody's hometown and the, all that stuff. That's, 
people still do that. A few people who have really great jobs with outlets like ESPN or The Athletic, you can get that kind of access. But the the day when people at every newspaper in, in America did stuff like that is is long gone. And it's it's really hard to get one of those jobs these days. Yeah, it is it is weird how things have changed, haven't they? Um, the athletic you mentioned is probably like the most modern day version, I guess, of that. Um, but even that has got its own problems. Right, before we end up on an hour long chat with Les about journalism, because it's it's yeah. always been a passion of we mine. Can do um, that, yeah. Yeah, maybe another time. Um um, I'm, I've always been really interested in it. Um, part of the reason why there's obviously we brought you on is that you have a, a an extremely sort of good wealth of knowledge, I guess. Um, so this we try to come up with some interesting ones maybe that I haven't heard from you or I haven't seen you write about okay. in specific. So the other one that me and Shane came up with was, has there been a certain player? Because obviously we're talking about journalism. You probably got close to certain athletes. You probably remember certain faces. Is there a certain player then in the 20 odd years that you've covered the team that stood out to you as the most enjoyable athlete to cover for the Eagles? And if so, uh, why? Well, you, you're in the danger of recency bias with something like this, but I'm still going to say Brandon Graham because he has been here a very, very long time, longer than anybody I ever you know, covered in any sport. And he's been so genuine and decent the whole time. Uh, his rookie year, he started out by shaking every reporter's hand at his introductory press conference. And he continued with that tradition every time he saw us for most of the year. And it was kind of like, okay, Brandon, we, I, we okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can talk, you know, without doing this, but uh, you know, a very genuine, decent person who always, he went through a lot of adversity in his early years as an Eagle and uh, didn't get bitter. Didn't get, uh, you know, didn't demand to be traded or anything like that. And really became one of the, uh, franchise icons of all time, I think, uh, with what he did in the Super Bowl. Um, just a really good person. But there are several. There are a lot of people like that. Uh, of course, everybody remembers Brian Dawkins. Uh, I haven't been around Doc in close to 15 years now, but, you know, uh, I, I did cover him. Um, there, there are several. Nick Foles, great guy. Um, but uh, Brandon would be my number one. Brandon Graham's one of my favorites. I, I remember rooting so hard for him a couple of years ago to get that, finally get that 10 sack season. And I was so happy when he finally got it, but uh, you know, you talked about a few players, let's narrow it down even a little bit more. Is there like a favorite story maybe a behind uh -huh. the scenes story that not everybody knows? Uh, is there like a favorite memory or story that you have from covering the team behind the scenes? Well, you know, I thought when you when you asked me that question, I wasn't sure what I thought you wanted like tea to be spilled here or something. You know, um, I have. I don't know if I have a well, we don't have to get you in trouble, but yeah. we don't have to get you in trouble. But <laughs> um, the, well, Reno Mahe, remember Reno Mahe, the punt returner, uh, undrafted guy, little tiny guy, um, kind of an odd fellow in some ways, a little bit, uh, a little bit of a naive guy who didn't quite, uh, you know, he, it was a big adjustment to him, Philadelphia. Uh, Reno was uh, inactive for his first NFL game. He was on the 53, but he wasn't activated for the game. And so he, in a panic, he, he grabbed a teammate and wanted to make sure that he still got paid for this, you know, even though he wasn't going to play. <laughs> and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You still get, they still have to pay you. You know, you're just not going to be on the field, <laughs> but he was, he was worried about that. <laughs> Another story. Uh, it's not a funny story, but it kind of is, is an inside kind of thing. And I have written about it. So it's not like I'm going to be, uh, this is not some deep, dark, terrible secret, but the worst year I ever covered was 2012. Uh, that was the year that Andy Reid's son Garrett died in training camp. And the team started out three and one and just went off a cliff. It uh, won one game the rest of the season, finished four and 12. Andy got fired. And what happens in a situation like that? And it had happened, I think, this past season down the stretch. 
players sort of you reach a point where it's not about matchups anymore. It's it's like players have lost the thread. They don't believe in what they're being told to do. They don't believe there's going to be any payoff at the end. And some of them just sort of disengage. And uh, they had a corner, uh, Dominique Rogers Cromarty, who was a very good player. Um, but Andy Reid had to call him into his office and say, hey, you know, you're still getting paid here, buddy. <laughs> you know, how about if you show up <laughs> and do your job? Uh, that happens, you know, and I, it doesn't mean that you're a horrible person. Uh, but on bad teams, guys just lose the juice. You know, they just like, why am I doing this? What, what's the point? It's a tough game to play. And if you're not committed and if you're not, you know, really uh, convicted, I guess, of what you're trying to do, it's, it's, it's not going to get, it's going to be pretty. And that's kind of what happened that year. And I, I'm pretty sure I saw that down the stretch last year too. Uh you know, it'll be it's kind of the one of the back burner issues of this training camp and this season is is everybody back in the barn is everybody, you know, understanding that uh, the Eagles are good again and being and really, you know, ready to shake off whatever happened there at the end. Yeah, I think it's something that maybe fans forget that they're just like, I guess it's a job. And I think sometimes yeah. sports is like the greatest privilege in the world. But I think also um, it's a really hard job. And I mean, I follow sports very, very closely, not just American sports, obviously UK sports. And I think people are sort of kidding themselves if they think that those sort of relationships, if people don't start sort of, if a season's not going very well, you have to look after your health. And there's always a, there's always another contract around the corner that you need to protect yourself for. And I think sometimes we overanalyze things when there's quite a basic human element to it sometimes. Yeah. And it is just that players know the season's not going very well. They know that they're not going to be for a team. And uh, and it may end up that essentially they think they're better off not playing as hard as they can. I think that's the same in probably any walk of life. It's not just yeah. sports, as yeah. you mentioned. Um, you sort of team me up nicely, Les, because rather than doing maybe your least favorite Eagle season, um, is there any sort of season that over time stands out to you? I know the obvious one for fans oh. is always going to be the Super Bowl one. Yeah. I guess from a journalist point of view, um, does it matter sort of how far the team get? I guess it matters if the team are engaging without a doubt. But is there a is there a season that really stands out to you as like a really fun one, I guess, or engaging one for you as a journalist to cover? Yeah, that's a very good question, Johnny. And I, you're right. I mean, you don't want to behave as a fan, as a journalist, you know, you want to keep a distance, uh, a perspective, because if you're writing as a fan, yeah, you know, the fans already know how, what it feels like to them. They want somebody who's a little bit removed to, to look at this uh, with a, with an unjaundiced eye. Uh, so you do that as much as you can, but that having been said, winning is a lot more fun the players are more fun to be around. Uh, the coaches are more forthcoming. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a, an easier job when the team is winning. Uh, you get more, you know, notice. Your, your stories are read more. Um, you might get it if they win. You know, you might get an opportunity to write a book or something, you know. Um, so it's, I mean, we pretend like we don't care, but it's better for us if the team's doing well. Um, so that Super Bowl season was amazing. I've never covered anything like that with uh, Wentz. That day in, in L.A. when he went down, well, it's been a lot of fun, but that's it for this season. <laughs> you know, and then uh, what happened after that was just incredible. I've never in any sport covered anything like that. So that has to be at the very top, uh, even though it's obvious, uh, it's just so unique. But if I had to pick a second one, I would probably say 2013, that first Chip Kelly season. I know people now, you know, what happened with Chip after, you know, really kind of colors the whole thing. But that, that year was so magical. Uh, the team wasn't supposed to be any good. Is that we were talking just a minute ago about the 2012 season, four and 12. Uh, Chip came in and they just came out with guns blazing. They went down to Washington for the opener, and Chip was like lining up unbalanced lines and throwing the ball 80 yards through. The Michael Vick was 
finding Deshaun Watson, to Deshaun Jackson all over the field. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a fascinating year to cover, despite what happened after that. It was it really like football was kind of being reinvented in some ways. Practice was different. There was that was the first year of like music at practice. Everybody does that now, but Chip was like the pioneer of that. Um, you know, the the emphasis on nutrition and health and, you know, that's continued. The, the Eagles kept all that stuff, you know, even though they didn't like Chip, but they liked all the stuff that he was <laughs> interested in. Um, you know, it, if Chip could have had a different personality, I think he would have been a, a an archetypal coach who would have lasted a very long time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that season would be number two for me. And then the, I guess the, uh, the Super Bowl 39 season would be number three with T.O. when things were going well. Again, everything kind of got, you know, went down like a collapsing souffle uh, a few months later. But uh, T.O. that year with T.O. getting to Jacksonville and the, and the Super Bowl, almost winning it, uh, that, was, uh, that was an incredible journey as well. It's funny um, that you picked the Chip Kelly year because for me, personally as someone who didn't really know this so i was a fan of the sport i got into it in 09 um because friends in the uk watched it and i remember the first year i believe the first game i ever watched and you're probably covering it there's when the eagles beat the rams was it 38 free or something i seem to remember yeah. hanging basket caught along so that was the first game i ever watched um and i wasn't really into the film and i think the reason why i got into film basically was because i didn't really know what i was watching it was like watching a sport that you'd never played as a kid you never really watched it with parents it was just completely brand new so I almost taught myself like a bit of a manual, you know, like go and get the book. And like, I always say I have a different perspective on it as a Brit because I didn't grow up with the sport. And I, I think I probably have not maybe even said this on a podcast, but I think Chip completely like changed the way I viewed the game. Like he made me interested in it on a different yeah. level. Um, I've spoken off air about Chip Wagon, um, the blogger who basically just had a, a whole blog about the Oregon Ducks. And I fell in love with that. And I read everything and I actually met, um, Ryan from the chip wagon in person uh, this year, which is quite cool. So it's funny that as a as a journalist, that's the first one you went to, or the second outside of the Super Bowl, which is, I guess the obvious one. Because um, I can remember how exciting it was. I think Eagles fans in the past, maybe even newer fans than us, who have covered it for like the past five or six years, don't realize how exciting that that first game against Washington. It was like a different sport was being played. It was like a it different really world. was. It was incredible. It was one of the most amazing games. Yeah. You know, in, in my career. And uh, if it had all continued like that, you know, <laughs> he'd be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but, yeah, I think you were spot on when yeah. you said it was the it was the human element, wasn't it, of Chip, which shows why sports are so difficult. It's not just about um, the X's and O's. You're dealing with human beings. You're dealing with people. Um, but it's really interesting because, yeah, that was the uh, that was that was the season for me as well. I think that made me really interested. And to be honest, I struggled a little bit when Chip left because I was so into his scheme and the way he did things um and when sort of he left it was almost like well how the hell would you have success without this like this is the future um but i guess like everything it goes round uh in circles yeah. but yeah that's interesting uh, from a journalist because chip must have given you a hell of a lot of stories as well because he didn't really um mince his words did he too well he sort of said what he thought all the time as well so a lot of the writers hated great. chip because chip yeah. was a smart ass but yeah. i'm kind of a smart ass <laughs> So I kind of got along with him pretty well. You had to realize, you know, what his tricks were and how he was going to, he didn't like to, he looked for loopholes. His dad was an attorney and he would look in the way you asked a question, if you gave him an out. In fact, real quickly, the story about how Chip ended up getting fired before the end of the season in 2015. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a press conference. The Eagles had lost and, uh, you know, things were going bad and there was a press conference and Howard Eskin asked Chip, you know, as the general manager, are you responsible for this? And Chip being, you know, you know what had happened. They had kicked Howie Roseman aside and put Chip in charge of personnel, but they didn't give him the title of general manager. So Chip thinks, well, I've got a way to get out of answering this and says, oh, oh no, I'm not the general manager. No, no, you'd, you'd have to ask Howie Roseman about that. I'm, I, I'm just, I'm the coach, you know. And he thought that was like a real smart thing to do. 
Well, Jeffrey Lurie saw that and was like, okay, that's it. Enough of this guy. <laughs> yeah. um, it was a clever answer, but it wasn't a truthful answer. Uh, he did not have the title of general manager, but he certainly did, you know, uh, release Deshaun Jackson and trade LaShawn McCoy and, you know, draft the guys from Oregon that couldn't play, uh, you know, and uh, it, it was – I don't know whether he really intended to not take responsibility for that or whether he just didn't want to answer that question that day, but he basically talked himself out of being able to finish the season by, by saying it that way. But that was his manner. You know, he would scrutinize. You had to be very careful how you phrase something to get an answer out of Chip, a, 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 an honest answer. You, you mentioned earlier the Carson Wentz injury in 2017 and, I was I was in Nigeria for the month of like from like mid November to mid December finalizing the adoption of my daughter during that. And so obviously the time difference, not having good internet things, I was I could like check box scores and read about the games, but I couldn't watch mm -hmm. them. And I distinctly remember like I knew that was a huge game. We went to bed and I woke up at like three in the morning when the power went out to go start our generator. And once I got it started, I knew the game was over. I was like, I'm just going to check it really fast before I go to sleep. <laughs> and I've never experienced such a roller coaster of emotion, like checking the score and seeing that the Eagles won. And that was clinching the conference, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then I clicked the box score and seeing that Nick Foles played, you know, through 10 passes in a one score game. And I was like, it was too close of a game to pull people. And then clicking on the recap and seeing that it was feared that Carson Wentz tore his ACL. Like I was all over the place, just up and down in a, in a matter of, well, it wasn't moments. It took like a minute for the page to load, but I, I just remember that I'll never forget that. That's one of my biggest memories, I guess, from that whole season. Um, and it was a really weird atmosphere because the Rams had just moved back to LA and they were still playing at the old Coliseum which they were trying to renovate uh, for USC, the, uh, whoever owned it was trying to renovate it for USC. So they had like a makeshift press box and the locker rooms were so tiny that you couldn't, the only time in my life I've ever covered a regular season NFL game and not been able to go into the locker room. They, they said literally nobody can go in, we'll bring players out. So we're standing like beside the stadium, you know, uh, getting guys as they come out of the locker room and Wentz goes riding by on the back of a golf court cart and kind of waves to us, you know, it was just, it was unreal. It was just, the, the, it wasn't like a, an NFL normal setting, you know, where you have uh, press conferences in a, in a press conference room and you're talking to guys at their lockers, you know, it was like, where are we at the County fair here? Or what? You know, I mean, it was, it was so bizarre and, and such a, like you said, such a roller coaster of a game. I think we all just assumed that the season was pretty much over because Nick hadn't shown that much. I mean, he had gone away and come back uh, after failing as the Rams quarterback uh, when they were in St. Louis and, uh, even if you remember that, you know, Nick had a terrible game against the Raiders at the end of the season. And there was a lot of talk about whether they should go to the third string quarterback or what, you know, and then, then the first playoff game against Atlanta, I think the final score was 15 to 10. Nick didn't like that up either, but then the next two games, he was perfect. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was quite a year really was. Uh, Les, I'm going to go a little bit off script to shame those I, uh, I love to do very quickly. Um, not to put you on the spot and ask you a bit of a random question, but as we're talking about him, um, as a journalist, what did you make of, and I'm not going to ask you to say bad things about anyone, don't worry, we're not that kind of podcast or kind of people in general, um, but what was Carson Wentz like to cover? Like, could you see a reason why his career has essentially faded? Could you sort of like, did he come across as? Because I think as we're, as fans, obviously we we see the social media clips, and even when we watch the press conferences. But I think there's a difference between being a human being in the room with somebody. You probably have off air interactions, just like friendly hellos and goodbyes, like you said about Brandon Graham. Um, could you like predict it with Wentz? Could you see anything there, or do you think it was sort of an unfortunate injury and just his 
athletically never recovered. Um, sorry, I put you on the spot there for a bit of a difficult question. I could talk um, for several hours about this, but I don't think that's what you really want. Uh, I didn't see it very quickly at all. I had covered him. I've met him at the senior bowl, uh, you know, before the Eagles drafted him. Uh, I covered the draft that year in Chicago. Um, seemed like the greatest guy in the world. <laughs> um, the Super Bowl season, everything was great. He was fine. He was, he said all the right things, did all the right things. I know the Eagles believe, I, I do think, you know, that night in Minnesota when the Eagles won the Super Bowl and Wentz and Foles are on the podium with the trophy, I remember thinking, this is so strange. This has never happened before, you know, and it's going to have a ripple effect somehow. I couldn't tell you how. I couldn't really chart out exactly what was going to happen after that, but it was an unsettling sort of, it was this, from Wentz's perspective, this wasn't how it was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to be the guy to do this. Um, and I know the Eagles feel that he, that made him deeply insecure, that he, that started his decline. And I think there is a physical, to wrap this up quickly without taking another half hour, a physical element of it eventually emerged. You know, he was, when I, re, when I think of Carson Wentz in 2017, I don't think of him just sort of taking the snap, dropping back and finding a receiver. I think of him getting back there. There's a rusher coming. He stiff arms the guy, spins around, takes two steps to the left, and, you know, flings it 60 yards downfield. For whatever reason, he got to where he couldn't do that anymore. He couldn't spin off that rusher. Uh, maybe it was just knowing, understanding all too well what could happen if the guy hit him, you know. But he stopped making those kinds of plays. Uh, maybe defenses had something to do with it. I don't know. but. That and the fact that he turned out to be a pretty insular person who didn't really, players didn't gravitate toward him. He came from, you know, North Dakota. Um, he was really not uh, one of the guys very much. I do remember thinking about that, even when things were going good, about the fact that he was so religious and he had this tight little group of friends, Trey Burton, um, Chris Maragos, uh, two or three, Ertz, a couple other guys who were part of his Bible study. And I remember thinking, you know, you're the quarterback of the whole team. If there's guys that aren't in Bible study and don't care about that, are you their buddy too, you know? And it kind of turned out that he wasn't. <laughs> um but I didn't see it for a long time. And what happened the next couple of years made it even harder because while he wasn't playing as well, Howie also wasn't doing as well. The, the roster, the talent, the, the playmakers just steadily declined. You know, by 2020, he was throwing the ball to practice squad guys. And I had a lot of empathy for that. You know, it wasn't, all the fans ever saw was Wentz, you know, but except for the offensive line, the team went to hell around him and uh, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, uh, they kept drafting J.J. Ortega Whiteside and Jalen Rager. And, you know, uh, they didn't they didn't know favors, no favors whatsoever. And then Jalen Hurts with a second round pick, uh, you know, at a time where they desperately needed. Uh, weapons. And I could see his point there too, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, then in a nutshell, that's what I think. I think it it was insecurity off of the Super Bowl and then physical deterioration. Uh, I'd still like to see him get, after he left the Eagles, he was never with a good team. <laughs> um, I'd still like to, he's in Kansas city. Now it'd be really funny if Patrick Mahomes went down for six weeks and, and Wentz had to jump in there and played lights out. <laughs> and I think that's still a theoretical possibility, but I doubt it will happen. 
the thing the thing with the Chiefs is I'm not sure they're a good team without Mahomes too. Yeah. So good when point. you look at their yeah. weapons, but I remember I wavered a little bit. And then the 2019 season, when he throws for 4,000 yards without a 500-yard receiver, I was like, "We, you just have to get him some weapons. And then they drafted Jalen Rager, which I yeah. wasn't crazy about. And then they drafted Jalen Hurts, which I hated that uh, yeah. pick at the time. And I was just like, man. And then just to see him fall off a cliff in 2020, it, right. it was wild. Um, he made it impossible to defend him because he just – like I was saying about players in the 2012 season who just sort of, you know, I don't think Wentz gave up, but I think he just totally panicked and started throwing the ball all over the place. And, you know, it was uh, it, uh, it, one of the strangest things I've ever covered. But yeah, yeah, that and the career arc of Nick Foles and it's all intertwined, yeah. but it's just fascinatingly weird. You could make Hollywood could make a movie that told that story, and I wouldn't believe it. Like I wouldn't believe it was based on a true story. But um, well, Nick's kind of like Ryan Fitzpatrick was. You know, yeah, Nick can give you two or three amazing weeks, but he can't keep it up. And one of the things that galled me about the whole Wentz saga was people now are saying, "Well, they should have made Carson the the court. I mean, uh, Nick the quarterback after the Super Bowl." If you remember, Nick started the next season because Carson wasn't ready and he wasn't good. And by the time Carson came back in week three, fans were clamoring for him to to get back in there, you know, because Nick, no, 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 you know, and, uh, you know, that's that's but the legend, you know, Nick has the statue outside the stadium and that's all people remember. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, let, let's move on to this one. Um in all in your years covering the team, and there's some obvious answers from the Super Bowl, but what is your most memorable play from your time covering the team? And I'll I'll lead off one with here because we mentioned Chip Kelly earlier, and we're we've been talking about being wrong about people. I thought Chip Kelly was an absolute genius. The first game, whatever what was it, 2015, after he traded Lashawn McCoy for Kiko Alonso and Kiko Alonso made that diving one handed over oh, yeah. his head interception yeah. in the end zone. I think it was against the Falcons. I was like, Oh man, chip Kelly is not only a genius coach. He might be miles ahead as a GM. And that turned out to be laughably wrong, but that yeah. one sticks out to me is just, that was such an incredible play. I haven't seen a linebacker make a play like that in Philadelphia since I had forgotten all about that, but yeah, you're right. That was an amazing play. Um, Brandon Graham in the Super Bowl is the most memorable play to me because that was when, you know, despite the Philly special and all that stuff, I still thought Tom Brady was going to lead the Patriots back <laughs> to win the game. And, and it, he ended up still getting another chance after that. But when Brandon Graham knocked that ball loose and Derek Barnett picked it up, I thought, oh, my God, the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I never had had that feeling. I never had it in Super Bowl 39 at all, frankly, even though there was all that, oh, McNabb threw up. and I, The Patriots were a better team in that game. But, uh, you know, that was the first time in my time of covering the Eagles that I actually thought the Eagles are winning the Super Bowl. And uh, that's my most memorable play. But another play that I really love, and it it's not a real obscure play. You see it a lot of times on Twitter. Um Patrick Robinson's interception that he ran back for a touchdown against Minnesota. It was like, you, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, the family circus, that uh, cartoon that's in the paper with the little kids. They, they, one of the characters is this kid named Jeffy. And, and every now and then he'll go on a, they'll do like dotted lines of Jeffy's uh, traversing the neighborhood, you know, jumping through all the puddles and, and swinging on trees and stuff. And there's all this, uh, back, you know, like a huge uh, diagram of, of everywhere Jeffy has been. Patrick Robinson was like that on that interception return. He was started out over here and then he goes to the middle and then he's on the right side. And, you know, then blockers start appearing and it was just the most amazing. It was the most amazing return I've ever seen of an interception. And it that's what really got that NFC championship game route going. Yeah, it was a pretty even game up until that point. And then he did that and the Eagles just took off. And, uh, you know, I, that that's that's a big play to, in my mind. 
It's cool that I guess it shows that Super Bowl season, doesn't it? You can see why they live in uh, sort of memory because there are so many individual plays. It makes you wonder if they didn't win it all at the end, whether those plays would would stand out at all. There's probably hundreds of plays that are more exciting, but because of what it led to, I guess, sports are like stories, aren't they? It, it all sort of adds up. Um, I think you've got the vibe from now, Les, that we speak to you a lot about just like journalism and the way people mm-hmm. cover the team. So when we were putting together questions, I was interested for your thoughts about this because we are now heading into training camp and fans that are listening to this obviously know the Eagles um, they're about to start basically now, aren't they? I know teams were already there last week. I, th- I know that you watch training camp and I know a lot of other journalists and obviously you can't report on everything and I know they're very strict about filming and stuff. How like good of a vibe do you get when you're watching it? Like, because I'm intrigued. I've never been to a training camp. I've never seen a professional NFL team train. Do you look at them and go, they're going to be good this year? And do you feel like you get that right? Because I always think it's interesting when they say, oh, the offense looks great, but then it's yeah. just because the defense is rubbish. Um, so, like, would you say that as a journalist who's been to quite a few training camps, do you feel like you can get a vibe for how good a team is going to be based on training camp? And would you say it's a relatively accurate vibe? Um so I think BLG has always said that he can often tell like what problems are going to occur. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not calling BLG a liar at all, of course. Um, but I'm interested to hear uh, to hear your opinion on that as well. Well, I think Brandon is is a better technical observer than I am. Like I was saying earlier, I'm basically a guy who likes to write stories. I don't X's and O's to me. I read all that stuff. I find a lot of it really boring. <laughs> uh, I just don't. It's just not my my thing. So my answer is I'm often wrong about training camp. Um, There are things, usually it's in retrospect, when you go back and think about something that happened or something someone said, you know, eight or nine or 15 weeks later, you you think, hmm, I remember, you know, in August, such and such happened. And it turned out that was... uh, something we needed to keep an eye on, you know, but in the moment, oh, I've, I've been fooled many, many times. There are very few disastrous training camps. I mean, people have to get hurt. Uh, you know, nobody cares about the preseason games. Um, it, it's hard for training camp to look awful. Um, if there are position battles that aren't resolved or aren't resolved in a, you know, in a way that makes you feel they've got this covered. You can often tell that. Uh, I, I've often, I say, you know, there's years, how he kind of sets his linebackers up with like whatever ends up on the front porch. He just throws in there, you know, and some years that works out great. Like the year that they, uh, you know, the year they went to the Super Bowl two years ago, he ended up with good linebackers pretty much by accident. Uh, didn't re-sign them, and uh, last year ended up with terrible linebackers. And, uh, you know, there's things like that that you look at throughout training camp. Do they have, you know, is Devin White, for example, going to really be a, a big, big deal? You, sometimes you can tell stuff like that. Sometimes you can't. And it's less and less, you know, but in the Andy Reid days, they tackled to the ground and they were in pads and stuff like this, you know, much more the way they do it now. I mean, you, you see like one, the pass rusher versus the blocker one-on-one that drill, I get some stuff out of that. Uh, but a lot of what they do isn't conducive to me really being able to evaluate a player uh, accurately or a scheme. You don't even see the schemes that much. You know, it's, I don't get that good a feel from most training camps. It's it, usually training camp goes pretty well and you think they're in pretty good shape coming into the season. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool to be honest, because I sort of have the same vibe. I'm sort of a preseason bores me. I know we cover it and I cover it. Um, for sort of jobs as well. And I always look at individuals rather than scheme, but I always get annoyed when people talk about training camp, especially when you hear tweets like so-and-so's throw interceptions in training camp, yeah, et cetera. You get, and I always think I sort of want that as well, because that's the whole idea is you're trying stuff. Like if Jaden yeah. Hurst isn't trying to squeeze a throw over the middle to see if he's got the arm talent to see how, I imagine they do stuff to see how players react as well. Like you've got a young receiver, yeah. let's see how he handles this. So I always, as much as like everyone else, I used to be obsessed with training camp tweets. Um, 
I used to follow them religiously and I, and I still sort of do. And I think everyone just craves football so much. In some ways, that's quite nice. Um, I sometimes worry that sort of the season's over before it's begun or mm -hmm. they're going to be really good. Um, but I think, although you say about BLG being very good, I think he looks at individuals as well. I think I remember BLG in particular pointing out the Wentz and the Hurt still. Uh, and I remember the year Wentz wasn't very good. He seemed pretty yeah. on it at training camp that he just didn't look right. And I guess there are certain things you can tell maybe about individual star players. But realistically, um, I think probably fans in general go a little bit mad over training camp and preseason. But I think that we're star for content, aren't we? It's a strange sport, the NFL, because there's such a long gap between yes. games. You well, have to read into everything. One thing you do have to watch out for that I have learned in training camp is you have all these guys, fringe guys, who are out there yeah. playing for their lives, you know. And you have guys like Brandon Graham who are just trying to get through this until tomorrow, you know. And a guy can look real good in that setting, but it's not like he's playing in an NFL game, uh, you know. And it's it, fans get every year there's a wide receiver, it seems like, that fans get fixated on, uh, whether it's Ifiani Moma or uh, uh, who was that? Guy's made a long career now as a as a returner. Uh, DeAndre Carter, uh, you know, uh, Paul Turner. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, every every year there's somebody. I think it's going to be Wilson, Johnny Wilson, this year probably. But uh, you know, it's uh, you end up obsessing in training camp over guys a lot of times who at best are going to be on special teams. <laughs> and really aren't going to get a lot of snaps in the offense or the defense because that's what training camp is about, deciding who's going to be those guys at the bottom of the roster, uh, you know, who's going to make the team who, who wasn't drafted, uh, what uh, guy that they, you know, signed off of a practice squad somewhere is going to, you know, really show. Uh, but when you get into the meat of the season, that's not what the season's about. <laughs> Those guys. We, we both chuckle that when you mentioned Johnny Wilson. I think there's a clip out there from this podcast where Johnny mentioned that he thinks that Johnny Wilson is just a better, faster right. George Kittle or something. Yeah, this, like is this is also yeah. not true. This, this, this is the dangers of the podcast world, Les, you see. Uh, your your quotes can be taken out of context by your co-host, uh, which Shane loves to bring up now. I don't think you got that in old school print journalism. Although with Twitter, you probably did now, because I'm sure everyone can take a can take a comment out of context as well. Anyway, Shane, oh, yeah. that happens to me all the time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll I'll send you the clips later. It was funny, but uh, we'll we'll keep going here. Less. Um, there's been a lot of talk. I feel like recently the athletic had a story about Jalen hurts and Nick Sirianni mm -hmm. and potential tension there. And, you know, Johnny and I have discussed that off air. And I mean, obviously we don't have any idea and you may, you may not have any insight, but do you buy those stories? Do you buy that there's maybe some tension there between hurts and Sirianni? Do you think that's just, we want to talk about football and that's the low hanging fruit. What do you really make of those stories coming out? Well, I don't have a lot of inside information there, but I'll tell you this. Whenever, like two years ago, when things went great and they got to the Super Bowl, Sirianni and Hertz had a wonderful relationship, and Hertz was the greatest leader in the history of sports, and Nick was the smartest coach in the world. You know, that's what happens when you win. When you lose, like they did down the stretch last year, and – in particular, when the offense started struggling, relationships get strained at that point. Um, I think we all know that Jalen's personality and Nick's personality are very, very different. And I think we've all seen the clips of, of Jalen looking at the coach going nuts at a fan or something and kind of like, <laughs> and I'm kind of with Jalen on that one, frankly. Um, but I don't think there's, as far as I know, there's nothing irreparable uh, that has happened. I, I think they don't have to be great buddies for, for their partnership to work. I don't think Belichick and Brady were ever great buddies. Uh, I don't think Aaron Rodgers has ever been on the same 
wavelength as any coach he's ever played for. Um, they just had the, the offense has to work. And then I think the working relationship works. <laughs> and <clears throat> that's what I worry about, you know, is Kellen Moore bringing in stuff that Jalen Hurts can do that will make this all successful. And if it is, then Nick and Jalen will be just fine. <laughs> uh, if it isn't fixed and this isn't the answer, then one of them, probably Nick, is leaving at the end of the year. Um, maybe both of them. Who knows if things really go bad? I don't expect that. I expect things to go pretty well. But, you know, it's uh, it's it's going to – the relationship depends on – I don't think the relationship leads to winning or losing. I think winning or losing, you know, creates the relationship pretty much. I, as long as you don't have people who just absolutely hate each other and have no respect for each other, that's a different, I don't think we're in that ballpark. You know, uh, that, that is an unmanageable situation. I, I think we're more of the slightly pissed off at each other sort of uh, <laughs> sort of phase and i think that can certainly be repaired yeah the way you uh phrased that that's a good one for an article Les. if you haven't said that about the relationships uh the way you said it there was perfect about yeah the relationship will be fine if they win uh, the relationship won't be great if they lose um that's the same as a lot of things in life isn't it yeah um right as always as shane knows that we are historically known for overrunning by miles so apologize for taking up so much of your time i will leave you with one final thing uh, shane knows i absolutely hate predictions and i'm gonna not ask you for a number or anything, but despite the fact you said you don't often have a good feel in training camp because it's almost impossible. Um, I know you still follow everything the team does. I know you write about the team and you're probably invested in every move. Although, as you said, maybe a little bit differently to fan, but more as a journalist. Um, what are you expecting from this year? You mentioned very briefly about Kellen Moore. Do you mm -hmm. think from what the Eagles have done, they will be a successful team? Um, what are your, I'll, I'll leave you Shane after to finish, but to finish off, Les, what are your sort of expectations for this upcoming season? Well, I expect them to be good. I think they'll be very good. I, with the keeping in the back of the mind that we still don't really understand fully what happened down the stretch last year. Uh, and we don't know that changing coordinators is going to really be the master stroke that we all, you know, kind of think it might be. Um, I think things should come together here. Uh, they they made a lot of they, – they bolstered the personnel on defense quite a bit, which was really the root of, of last season's collapse. That's where it started. And then the offense kind of – it infected the offense eventually when the defense couldn't get off the field and the offense started feel, feeling pressure to, you know, score every time they got the ball after sitting on the bench for 20 minutes, you know. I think if they fix the defense and if if what Kellen Moore is telling Jalen Hurts, uh, you know, makes sense, I, I think they'll be a very good team. Uh, they're not in a conference with other than San Francisco. There's not a great team. I don't think uh, there are teams you worry about. Green Bay week one, you know, that's it, assuming Jordan Love gets his uh, contract thing worked out. I think that's a very good up and coming team. Uh, but I, the division, I, I doubt Dallas is going to be quite as good as it was last season, frankly. And I don't see anybody else really jumping up and winning 12 games or anything like that. Uh, I'd like the Eagles uh, to be very good this year. Uh, but some things do have to come together. And I'm never shocked if things don't go well because <laughs> I've seen it so many times. But I, I do expect them to go well. All right. Well, that that makes a lot of sense. And Les, I want to thank you for taking time out of the day to come talk to us, to our viewers here. We certainly appreciate it. It was my uh, pleasure. Before we get out of here, do you have any final thoughts that you want to get out there? Any articles coming out or your Twitter, anything that you want to plug? Oh, just real quickly, I will be there tomorrow. Uh, like I, I told you guys before we went on the air, I don't have a credential to be out with the Eagles all the time, but I'm doing a story for a, for a magazine. So I'm going to be... Uh, at training camp tomorrow, I'm going to be writing about that probably for PHLY. And, uh, you know, um, I'm excited about it. I'm, I, I, like I said, I don't get out there very much anymore. I hope uh, I remember where the field is and everything. So we can check your Twitter for the training camp yes. stats tomorrow. Yes, exactly. Yes. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, Johnny, do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here? Um, nothing personally. No, I said uh, it's it's always pretty cool to interview, uh, especially journalists. I don't know why. I still have that love. I'm an old school, I guess, at heart. I love interviewing journalists. I like talking about the history of the Eagles, especially as someone who didn't really follow the team as much like some of the stories you mentioned. I guess I didn't actually know about live, so it's always pretty cool. So, yeah, uh, I'm sure this, it seems really pointless me saying go and read Les because Les has got about uh, 10 times more followers than me on Twitter and probably had about a million more readers than me in my lifetime. But uh, I'm sure everyone will check you out if they don't already, Les. But, yeah, thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, giving some stories. Anytime, guys. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up. A big thank you to Les for joining us. You guys be sure you're following his work on Twitter at Les Bowen. You can check out some of his written work at phly.com. Uh we're on the eve of training camp and we're going to get out of here. But now that Johnny has told the viewers through this episode that training camp doesn't really matter, feels like a great time to announce we're going to have BLG on next week to break down everything he has seen in training camp. Uh, so be sure you clip this and send it to BLG. But we will catch you guys next week for another episode. Mm-hmm.